My name is Kathy Van Heck. I'm the Regional Structures Engineer for the Pacific Northwest Region. As he said, that's primarily Oregon and Washington. Our entire bridge program in Oregon and Washington has about 1,500 road bridges, about 1,200 trail bridges. And I entitled my presentation, Modular and Portable Bridges, Cost-Effective Tools in the Bridge Program Toolbox. I should add, it's not just cost-effective tools. They're absolutely a required tool in our toolbox at this point in time. We have a long history of use with modular and portable bridges. And I appreciated um, a couple things in Nick's presentation. I was glad to see it. He's got a picture of Mount St. Helens that I'm gonna have to try to get from him from one of those bridges. But uh, he referred to acro bridges as modular bridges and we do as well. Then our other definition is portable bridges and our portable bridges are those that are really pretty much designed to be picked up almost intact or in a couple pieces and move to other locations. And we have both of those in our program. So to start with, with the Forest Service in the history of temporary bridge usage, um, we actually, the Forest Service in the 50s and 60s, we'll start before what's on the slide, had um, a lot of timber production. And a lot of that timber production was accomplished by the construction of predominantly reinforced concrete bridges. Uh, concrete was cheap, labor was cheap, they were trying to get everybody back to work. It was a boom time. And we had a lot of bridges built in the late 50s and throughout the 60s that was reinforced concrete, that were reinforced concrete. As we got into the 70s and 80s, you're getting into the energy crisis, budgets are going down. Um, there was still a lot of logging going on, maybe not as much demand. And especially into the 80s, things were starting to pare down we didn't make as much money from timber sales. And because of that, we didn't have as much money. And so we started looking for temporary bridge options. And at that time, it was predominantly what's called a Hamilton Easy Bridge. A Hamilton Easy Bridge comes out in two halves lengthwise, and then they get connected together. And I will say the Hamilton Easy Bridge was made by the Hamilton Construction Company in Oregon. And then it was designed by uh, the Oregon Bridge Engineering Company. I'll show you a slide of that later on. So those were really important bridges and especially with logging, as you would know with forestry, you go into a site, you log an area, you replant the area, and then you walk out of that area for 45 to 50 years. And because of that, you don't need to have a permanent bridge. And in fact, you don't necessarily want a permanent bridge. You wanna keep people out, let that grow unless you need to go in a little bit and maintain it. So that was our predominant use through the 70s and 80s. And then we got to, as Nick mentioned, May 18th, 1980, when Mount St. Helens blew. We needed to develop access from 1981 to 1988. And remember that the bridges that were in that area were either buried in debris or destroyed themselves. There were no roads, no bridges, no way to get into the sites. So you had to launch the bridges from one side to get over there. And I said, I was going to tell everybody I don't have any pictures of Mount St. Helens bridges and here Nick put one into his presentation so I appreciated seeing that. So once those bridges got replaced with permanent structures, usually pre-stressed concrete in most cases, all of those materials came back and were just they were taken apart, stacked, stockpiled, and then we've had continued use on those since that time. So these have been in in service for, you know, 40 plus years. And uh, we use them in response to floods, post-fire access. I'll show you quite a few projects where we use those bridges. Then we also have other modular bridges in our system, including one Acro 700 series, which Nick also talked about. And we do have one maybe bridge. So what we are using predominantly now for shorter span applications are either big R bridges, big R is now with Contact ES, Oh, we've had some, we have some Roscoe bridges and rapid span bridges. And in the early 2000s, our budgets really, really tanked. And when they tanked, we had a need to right size our road system. So our highest level is maintenance level five, which is double lane paved, so forth. It goes down to maintenance level one, which is basically closed. Even at three, Three was supposed to be for passenger cars, but what we ended up doing is moving a lot of bridges down to a maintenance level two, which is really only supposed to be for high clearance access, like semis, et cetera. And because of that, we weren't investing as much in our maintenance level two bridges. 
and or our maintenance level two roads. And we were really looking for an option that was a little bit cheaper and easier. And in some cases also temporary. Maybe with that maintenance level two, we might decide at a future time, we don't even need that road. And we would go ahead and take that bridge out and decommission the road. So that's what we're doing more right now. We've got these, um, these short span prefabricated steel bridges is what we call them. It allows for a more reasonable construction standard. So our design considerations for temporary bridges used to be in the early days, a superstructure design of Ashto HS25 with mobile spars. Now mobile spars are huge loads. And you guys might know about them. Like a BU99 is like uh, 198,000 pounds. A BU101 is 202,000 pounds. And it's 202,000 pounds on like four axles where the back two axles are a tandem axle four feet apart. And they, the total load on those back two axles is like 145,000 pounds. So we needed bridges that could handle these big loads. Um, we did that. But the quick, the tricky thing about this is the superstructures were, as we say in the Forest Service, hell for stout, the substructure designs weren't always really designed, I guess I'll say. They were a lot of times put on logs, gabions, um, MSE, so um, mechanically stabilized earth walls. And some were a little bit more developed. I'll show you one of those. And then our railing system was primarily timber curbs or a W beam railing system. We'll say it was performance based. Most of the time, these bridges were short enough that nobody really hit the railing. The railing, especially curbs, deteriorated long before anybody thought to hit them. And as an agency, the Forest Service has some flexibility to construct even modular bridges that others might not be comfortable with, but they work for us. So now design considerations that we're challenged by now for either temporary or permanent bridges is we have to have a superstructure design of HL93 and um, in accordance with ASHTO LRFD. And we do use higher loads such as a U80 load um, sometimes when it's needed. We also, for our substructure designs, have to use the same design standard. And we have to look at sliding settlement, bearing on slopes, global stability, overturning eccentricity, the whole gamut. And that becomes a little bit challenging at times, especially when we're trying to keep our bridges a little bit shorter span. We use concrete, precast or cast in place for our foundations, MSE walls, some timber walls. And we have some considerations for temporary or short-term use with respect to foundations. So we don't usually consider extreme event. We figure that's not likely during the duration of use. And then our railing systems, we generally design for what's called a test level one which is kind of a low level with a curb or rail. We have a curb 18 inches above the wearing surface and then a full railing system. If we decided to put on a real railing system at 20 inches, 27 inches above the roadway, we, then we'd have to have approach railing on every corner. And we don't necessarily wanna do that. That really raises the cost a lot. So um, also I'm gonna mention some operations and maintenance considerations for bridges. We have to load rate all of our bridges. And we have found a little bit of a challenge with our easy bridges at 16 feet because you can get like a whole truck on one half of the bridge and all of a sudden things kind of fall apart. It, it reduces the load capacity a little bit. Now, if you put it down the middle, you can take tanks across it practically, but if you have to load rate it in conformance with LRFR, load, load reinforced factor rating and the manual for bridge evaluation, it becomes a little bit tricky. And then inspection, we have this opportunity to move to a 48 month interval for inspection, but usually bridges are on 24 months. Acro and maybe bridges, et cetera, a lot of times they recommend a 12 month inspection interval. We actually do 24 months because we pretty have, we have very low volume on our roads and we don't consider the reason. The reason for the 12 month recommendation is just to check the hardware. We just don't have the, the capacity or we don't have the volume of traffic that kind of, um, causes any problems generally with the hardware on the bridges, but we don't exceed 24 months for any of our modular bridges. And then with maintenance, you really want to, any of these, it's just like almost like any bridge, but you really want to clean the decks, especially so you can see it while you're inspecting it. You always want to clean the top of the bottom flange if you have weathering steel girders. Now I know a lot of folks are in the Northeast and they don't really use weathering steel because you guys use a lot of salt out there because you have weather conditions conducive to that. In the Forest Service, we do not use salt on any bridges because basically 
we have a different kind of road system that closes in the winter time. If you have snow on it, we don't plow it, we don't salt it, et cetera. So we're allowed to use weathering steel, but that comes with issues that if you have weathering steel girders, you need to keep them clean. And then also you need to be aware of areas with deciduous trees and lots of leaves in the fall, because when those leaves come down, if they get trapped on your bridge, they're acidic and they can really damage stuff long-term. I promised you a picture of a Hamilton Easy Bridge, basically very similar to many other prefabricated steel bridges that we have right now. It has four girders and it has a, um, in the middle, it has a diaphragm that basically once you put the two halves in place, you swing the diaphragm over and bolt it. The problem is that the decking is not continuous across. And again, that was where we're, we're running into problems when we go to load rate these bridges. The um, basically, Prefab bridges that have the corrugated steel bridge deck, which many of the, the bridges um, that are endorsed by the Steel Bridge Alliance have either pre, uh, precast um, concrete panels, cast in place panels, or they have um, the corrugated steel deck and that solved that problem of continuity across the deck. So this one is one of our oldest easy bridges that's in place. This is Swede Creek on the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest. It's been in place since 1982. So this one had a more permanent foundation on it. And I'm pleased since it's been in place since 1982 to know it wasn't just a log. Um, it did have, it looks like a soldier pile wall, somewhat a, some piles and then a, a stabilized earth wall. If I showed you this a little bit closer up, you would see that this needs new running planks on it desperately. Other than that, it's a perfect, perfectly functional bridge and it functions in our particular in our settings, it works. Uh, the next bridge I want to talk about is one called Merriam Creek. This was a Hamilton Easy Bridge that was actually in storage for a while. And then we had a problem. We had uh, some water, some flooding that basically undermined the footing. And the only reason this bridge hasn't collapsed is that this bridge actually had cantilever ends on the timber girder, which came down and sat on the ground. So now we're holding the uh, the foundation up instead of it holding the bridge up. We took the whole bridge out and replaced it with a Hamilton Easy Bridge. They came in and they actually redecked the bridge to bring it up, put some new curbs on it. So I call it the gift that keeps on giving because a lot of these prefabricated bridges, they have some maintenance standards that you follow. And once you follow those maintenance standards, you know, replacing the deck, checking the curbs, whatever, you can just keep on using them. They stay in very good shape. So this bridge was an interesting project following the 96 floods. We had to get a bridge in on this location very, very quickly. There's actually something called the Learning Center down here and the 96 floods wiped out every bit of access to this and we had people on the other side of this bridge. So they needed this bridge and we got this bridge in place, I think within two or three weeks. People were able to walk across the old bridge. Nobody could drive across the old bridge. You would say, that's kind of interesting. This is a log crib. What happened is this bridge scoured out six feet. And because it scoured out six feet, we decided we could put a foundation right over that. It had probably scoured as far as it was going to go. So we made this a 200 foot continuous bridge. It was actually um, continuous over this log crib. Later on, they determined that this was the alignment that they needed the final bridge to go on. And they said, well, what are we going to do? Now we need this bridge to be a single span bridge and it has to support itself. So they took this whole bridge, they de-launched it over to this side, they reinforced it by putting some cords on top of it, and then they actually launched the bridge back in another location that was adjacent to this alignment. So it was like right, right over here. And now it could stand on its own. It was one single span bridge, 200 feet long. And then they, um, blew the concrete bridge up to get it out of the way. And then when they brought the girders in for this bridge, these are pre-stressed concrete girders, we had a problem with the 200 foot span. Um, so we went in and we put in a temporary support at the third point, which held it up so that they were able to go right adjacent to this bridge, use the temporary acro and use it to put the girders in place, to haul the girder trucks out there, and put it in. So we had this bridge came out in like three different configurations for this project. And every time all the materials stayed on site and it was very useful and worked really well. 
so now we get into um, a few others and I'm focusing here mostly on acro and then I'll move into the other prefabricated bridges. But um, the acro, this is one on the middle methane on the Olympic National Forest. There was a pre-stressed concrete bridge here. You can see where one abutment is. It's a piling abutment. The other one's kind of off screen. A uh, debris flow in 2009 came down this drainage and literally knocked the bridge off its foundations, just sheared it off and dumped it down a waterfall a few, a little bit down the road here or down the stream. It went over like a 20 foot waterfall. We've actually never found some parts of this bridge, but we needed access into this site. So we went in and we actually launched an acro bridge and put it in place. And it stayed there until the permanent bridge came into place to, uh, to replace that with pre-stressed concrete. Um, this is another one. It's not in our region. It's up in Alaska, but this is excursion inlet bridge. This is a 130 foot bridge. It's got a lower loading standard. And that's because the only road access, there's no road access to this particular site, none at all. Everything for this bridge had to be barged in. And the reason we could go with a lower loading standard is because every load that would ever go on this bridge was already at Excursion Inlet. We knew what the loads were and we decided to just design it for those loads because the likelihood of anybody ever barging in anything bigger would be there. But you can see that um, they, there was an existing bridge here that was deficient. It had to be taken out and they launched this new bridge in place and uh, had to do it again with a, a, a with a launching nose and going over to the other side and it worked out really well. It's a great project. That was by the way done in from October 30th through November. So they were able to do it over the winter time and it was in place and it worked out. Um, our, our next acro project is gonna be this one. This is the Henline Bridge on the Willamette National Forest. It used to be a seven span, 170 foot long timber bridge with timber towers. You can see those towers there. Um, this is what it looked like in 2019. This is what it looked like in 2020 after the Beachy Creek fire. Those little rectangles you see in the picture are the running plates, steel running plates that used to be on the bridge. We're gonna be launching a 200 foot, um, a 200 foot Acro 300 series, a uh, double, double, I think it's a double, double reinforced, I believe. And that's gonna satisfy our needs. And we're gonna keep that in for five years and then hopefully go to a permanent solution at that site. Uh, Cause otherwise it's tying up all of our Acro materials. And then um, this one, Nick already showed this one, but this was the boundary bridge. Here's an aerial view. We didn't actually lose anything on the existing bridge, but it took out all of the approach here. That, that approach, that ground used to go all the way over to here. And when the river came through and widened, it took that out. And the fisheries people wouldn't let us put it back in. Plus it was problematic how to build it back up again. So we just ended up building that span as Nick showed you. This is a picture during the launching and then the final structure. And like I said, it's not pretty, but it does the job and everybody's very happy with it. Now I'm gonna to move to um, some prefab steel bridges. And just so you know, um, acro bridges aren't the only ones that can be launched. This is Lake Cushman Bridge on the Olympic National Forest. We had high flows that impacted the approach in 2009 and exposed this pile foundation. We needed to get access over the gap. It wasn't a very big gap, but you couldn't put any fill back in because it's a sheer, it's sheer, it's vertical down. We had, it was too much material to put in. Plus we didn't wanna bring trucks out here with these piles all exposed until we knew what was going on. So we actually launched prefabricated steel bridge over this. It was a little bit of a narrow bridge. We got a special bridge that's a little bit more narrow and it worked out great. We actually ended up, after this project, we took this one out and we put it on another site too. Um, the reason this is special is because our, normally our roadway widths are 14 feet and this bridge would normally be 14 feet, but we had it designed so that it would fit right inside our 14 foot curb to curb distance. And then in the end, what ended up happening is we had another prefab steel bridge put in for this span. It's over on this side and we got a prefabricated or a precast concrete deck on it so that it would match up more with the existing bridge. And that worked out, that was a really good solution for this project. Uh, Sulphur Creek on the Mount Baker Palmy National Forest we needed to increase the floodplain and we did it by using three spans of prefabricated steel bridges. The reason it looks curved is because the precast panels 
were very carefully designed by somebody who's actually on this this particular session sec, uh, session and basically he designed them like little wedges that fit together so that the end result was that we had a curved deck for these three spans and then it goes on to another um, concrete bridge at this site the reason we had to do this at all is because we had lost the approach fill on the concrete bridge and when we went to build that one back we were told by fisheries that this is part of the floodplain we needed all of this space unencumbered okay um, a lot of times we're using our prefabricated steel bridges for um, aquatic organism passage this shows a bridge called power uh, excuse me a culvert called pow pack which is supposed to be letting um letting fish through and it's not working at this particular site. Um, so we put in a prefabricated steel bridge. I can tell you that this has not been um, rewatered yet. So there will be water in this. It's just that at this point in time, it's still being diverted around here. This was just after construction. So then last but not least, I'll talk a little bit about maintenance issues. And with maintenance issues, if you are in shaded areas with high consistent moisture, there's anything semi-coastal, or you have a maintenance program that has a lot of lack of cleaning, which ours does. We just don't have a lot of money for our, our maintenance program. You're gonna get problems if you're using weathering steel. So you end up with laminar rust and scaling on the bottom of the web and on the top of the flange. And it's kind of hard to see where that transition is, but I've pulled sheets of, of rust scale off of this, uh, or laminar rusting off of the bottom of this particular flange. So one thing we always encourage our people to do when they're out doing inspections is take a brush along and at least clean off the top of the bottom flange. And that has a tendency to really preserve that. Not gonna be as much of a problem in the Northeast because you likely don't use weathering steel and you paint your bridges. And we do have some coastal applications where we've taken the bridges and we've used weathering steel, but we've painted over the weathering steel and that's a solution. It's just, if you do have weathering steel, it's usually pretty easy to maintain, you do have to make sure you keep it clean. Um, another problem was on the Boulder Creek Bridge on the Olympic National Forest. Again, this is a double-double acro, and it's um, it's a good, really good bridge. It's been in place since just after Mount St. Helens. This is where some of the materials from Mount St. Helens came to. But you have problems with the decking, where the decking can come up sometimes, so you have to go in and make sure your stringer clamp assemblies are tight. And then in this one, it's hard to tell, but in the channel section between the top and the bottom, there was leaf buildup in that channel and it created this really acidic environment. And even though the galvanizing is untouched, the bolts, um, which are, are black bolts, they're not usually galvanized for the cord bolts, it, it has been eating away at this material and now it's, it's rusting. We're gonna be going back in and replacing all of the cord bolts on this particular bridge. Um, and then another problem that you can't do anything about, this is Dr. Creek on the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest. This is actually a Roscoe bridge. Most of the ones I've been showing you are big R bridges, but um, this one was put in place brand new, didn't even have the, the wearing surface put on it yet. This was in 2006, this was in 2019. Unfortunately, if you look upstream from this bridge, this bridge is almost on a waterfall. It's very steep upstream, big rocks, it, drops off significantly after the bridge. And within the first couple of years after it was in place, one of these rocks dislodged came down and flung itself at our bridge and damaged the beam. Um, we don't have the money to, to, to basically straighten this at this time. If we ever had a need to do it, we would. If this doesn't serve very many people. So we've been able to basically, if I go back one slide, um, over on this side, see that big boulder there? That's directing traffic more over to the left side away from this particular beam so that they're mostly just using the downstream side of this bridge. But it's an issue we always have to be aware of. So in our inventory, a really quick inventory, right now we have eight Acro 300 series bridges in place. We've got uh, one that's 160 feet and then we're building the one this year that's got the plus two is we're doing a 90 footer for a timber sale. We're doing a 200 footer to replace the one that was burned in the fire. We do have the one Acro 700 series, which both Nick and I have showed you on the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest. We have one maybe bridge in place. And then as far as prefabricated steel bridges, we have at least 62. I think that number's higher. I was having trouble finding them in my database, but we have at least 62 in place right now. 
and we're gonna be installing five of them this year through contracts for a variety of reasons. So a very important tool in our toolbox. We couldn't do our work without it. I'd like to thank you for your time. And if there are any questions, I'm here to answer them.